Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours, the webcast where I answer your Microsoft database questions. I am coming to you from North Bay, Canada. I keep wanting to say North Bay, Alaska, but it's North Bay, Canada. I don't get up to Canada too often. Uh, but I'm here for Aaron Bertrand of the Microsoft database community. Uh, works at Stack Overflow. He's part of their migration up to Azure Managed Instances is throwing a, a curling tournament every year. He's been doing it for more than a decade, and uh, there's a trophy, and there's competition, and all this. I have never curled before in my life. You'll notice I have white sneakers on. I got these specifically for the curling. So uh, we're going out today to take a tour around Aaron's hometown and to uh, harvest maple syrup, which I am particularly excited about. I did not realize uh, you know, you, you hear about that kind of thing as a kid, but I, I never thought that I'd actually be able to see that. That's actually pretty spiffy. So let's take a look at your top voted questions from PollGab. My tea got cold asks, Kendra Little's recent article on the decline of SQL Server scared me, and it matches much of what I've been thinking privately. I'm heavily specialized into SQL Server. Should I be worried? And so this is kind of an interesting question, should I be worried? I, uh, for those of you who haven't seen my uh, Kendra's post, it talks a lot about uh, the decline in qu code quality from Microsoft, that they're not innovating as much, uh, that they're innovating more in things that are just marketing buzzwords uh, rather than improving the core quality of the product. The one thing that I will say is, is it's still a phenomenal database. The gotcha is just that it continues to look more and more expensive relative to what the alternatives are. So uh, be, working on an expensive product is always a great way to make money. Uh, the more that something costs, generally speaking, the more you're going to earn working on it. Um, I, but I, I don't know that it wouldn't behoove you to keep your options open. I don't think SQL Server is ever going to go away. Microsoft goes through these little cycles where, for a while during the Azure release, the, the releases, they were like, we're all in on Azure. And they like pulled all kinds of developers off SQL Server and had them go work on other stuff. And then later on, they figured that was a mistake and they brought developers back into SQL Server. I, I think that we're going through another one of those cycles. And I think that Microsoft will course correct before it's too late. Because, like, right now, they're pushing Microsoft Fabric so hard. And I, I, just have terrible feelings about that product. I sit and watch problems with it every day on Reddit. There's a very active Microsoft Fabric Reddit uh, subreddit where people complain about all the problems that they're having with it and how it's half-baked or not baked at all. Um, which is hard. I get, I get it's hard to bring out a brand new Microsoft data platform in, in, a, in, the, in the modern day and age where people expect so much. Uh, but I think that, that the fabric backlash will kick in at some point and people will go, we want something reliable. And then they'll, Microsoft will switch more development back into SQL Server. The other thing I'd say is that the SQL Server doesn't, you could almost say that it's feature complete. There are people who want more stuff. I'm certainly one of them. I mean, there's things I'd like table level restore among many other things. Um, but uh, the, the, in terms of co its competition, it's, it's fairly feature complete. There's, it's not, there's not a lot of things that you would look at another database and go, a cheaper database, and go, oh, Microsoft needs to do a better job to compete with that cheaper database. Usually the competition isn't the problem, the licensing price is. So, and there's not really, until they start fixing that, I think they're going to have a hard time. Uh, next up, SQL Knitter says, I have a chunky 17 terabyte database. Oh, I hear it. I hear a duck flying by in the background. Uh, where whose largest table is two terabytes? Check DB takes days to run. How can I tell which tables have actually been checked before I make the decision to refactor the job to use check table? That's a, it's actually two separate decisions there. One, you don't need to check the status in order to decide to refactor the job to use check table. If you want to refactor the job to use check table, that's based on just the pure runtime. If you decide that it's taken longer and you can't offload it, then just go refactor the job to use uh, check table. And you can either start, what I would do is I would code CheckDB to start with the smallest tables and work up, logging to a table as you move through. 
I, I, I'm saying all this out loud. I've never done it before, but you'll see why here in a second. Um, move from the smallest tables to the largest. You'll get a real quick feeling for like gigabytes per second that it can move through on those smaller tables. Or you should do what everybody else in the world does and offload it to a secondary. Either offload it to an availability group secondary, a log shipped secondary, a restored server. You know, just offload it that way. Um, Sand snapshots are phenomenal for this. Um, because then that way you know you've got another replica that's clean and free of corruption that you can fail over to in the event that you hit corruption on your current primary. Other, otherwise, if you hit corruption on the primary, all you're good, all that tells you to do is, okay, now my work starts to try to recover from this. And you still have to restore the database somewhere else because you don't want to restore it onto the same instance that's having corruption problems because it's having corruption problems. You know, you can't trust the, the Windows, the SQL installation, or the storage. Uh, you've got to have another server to restore it to. Well, then that's the place where you should be already restoring the database and running CheckDB against it so you know you have a clean copy. That's why I've never broken down CheckDB into parts, is that it still doesn't get me across the long-term finish line there. That'd be my advice. Uh, Smart Python asks, what metrics can I use to determine if my manual failover AG can safely be promoted to automatic failover? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I, I think you're asking um, how an async AG or an async replica versus a sync replica. I think you're asking, can I promote an async replica to a sync replica? Um, because it, the manual failover versus automatic failover, it, it, you, you have to be in sync mode first. Um, so if you're trying to decide async versus sync, what I would just do is on a weekend, flip it to sync. Flip Because you can do it at any time whenever you want. Flip your async replica over to sync on a weekend and see how your workloads go on your primary. If people start pulling their hair out screaming, saying that performance is unacceptable, well then you have your answer. And you can flip back to async very quickly that way. Um, that, yeah, that's where I would start. Sometimes I go, sometimes when I give these answers, I want to think more deeply and go, uh, well, what are alternative answers? But, you know, at the end of the day, I, you pay me to get you the right, you pay me, it's free, you're paying with your time, uh, to get the answer quickly, not necessarily uh, talk through a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't do. Let's see here. Next up, always query with Tablock says, I have an app that churns temp tables outside of tempdb. Temp tables outside of tempdb. Okay, so I think what that means is that they're creating and dropping tables in user databases. It says, so often that schema locks are my biggest problem. I can ask devs not to create temp tables this way if I back the reason with statistics, but how do I gather stats on something blocked for minutes but it's only used for seconds? Oh, very easy. Track wait stats at the server level. Track wait stats at the server level and track your blocking that way. Because if you're correct that the, that's your biggest bottleneck, that, that uh, the top locks sh or the top wait stats should be locking. Uh, if it's not, then that's kind of your answer, that you're barking up the wrong tree. But assuming that you're correct, that your top server level wait stats are uh, locking, then what you explain to the developers is, look, I know each individual query isn't that big of a deal, but this is killing my server with death by a thousand cuts. Overall, the SQL server's top weight stat is locking on schema mods. This takes memory uh, in order to track these locks. It takes CPU, etc. So that's where I would start. Uh, next up, St. Bear says, what's your opinion of the SQL upgrade assessment functionality in SSMS 21? I haven't used it. Normally, I read these questions before uh, I start the webcast just to pull out some of the questions that I know I can't answer, like this one. I made a mistake today. I didn't read the questions ahead of time. So there you go. Uh, Mike asks, hi Brent, you mentioned you go to bed and get up very early. How and why you started doing this and were there any specific reasons or benefits for you? Nope, it's just the way that my body's wired uh, ever since. I, I noticed in high school that I would get up earlier and earlier, that I would get up at uh, 6 a.m., then at like uh, 5.30 a.m., then 5, you know, gradually through my high school without an alarm. Um, and it's just progressed that way throughout my life. It's not always that way. This 
morning I got up at eight, but uh, that was because I had uh, a red eye flight last night and hardly got any sleep at all on that. Didn't take a nap, was out running around here in Canada. So usually though, it's like two, three a.m. Uh, Dick Bowen asks, I restored a SQL Server 2008 database to SQL Server 2022 and the size doubled. What would cause this to happen? Um, so th I bet that you changed something else at the same time that you did this. For example, maybe you turned on RCSI, maybe you uh, turned on uh, local temp, the, the uh, in database tempdb stuff, in database versioning. I bet something else changed. I can't think of anything offhand that would cause that without other changes. If you were truly curious about that, what you could do is uh, try it again on another server, but this time make sure you don't change anything else and nobody else is involved. Uh, Venkat asks, what's your opinion of Uber's new query GPT for converting natural language to SQL queries? There are a lot of companies doing this, a lot of companies doing this. There are dot coms that are uh, racing to pioneer this so that they can charge money for it. Um, I think that it's, it's not new. It's been Power BI has had natural language querying for years, I think. Um, and it's just a matter of if it, for rapid prototyping, it's fine. For things where you don't need exact accuracy, it's fine. For things that need to be legally defensible, like profit and loss statements, things like that, then you just start with the proof of concept query, and then you go in and analyze it in more detail to make sure that it's correct. Because often the queries just aren't quite technically correct. Uh, next up, Vinit says, is throwing hardware at database performance problems more likely in Postgres than in SQL Server? Yes, because you can add CPU licensing or add CPUs without having to pay anything for licensing. Uh, you can easily, you know, double your CPU power and you don't have to worry about spending more in the database server. Whereas in, in SQL Server, each time that you double CPU power on a real world production server, you're talking about teams of people salary. Uh, by the time that you look at all the replicas that are involved. Uh, and then let's see here. Um, there's that's an odd question. I don't know what that I don't know what that question is asking. So we'll do let me make sure I hit my uh, goal of yeah, I usually try and hit 10 minutes. Uh, so let's see, we'll do one more before I go back inside. Um, Silent Knight says, what's your take on standards other than they're good to have? What effort would you expend to enforce standards on an environment that's very inconsistent? Things like database locations, physical file names, table names. And he says, for, for uh, uh, perspective, I have a prod server with 30 servers, or prod has a 30 server environment with 300 databases. Dude, who cares? Who cares? Are your users going to notice any difference whatsoever when you're done enforcing your standards? Be really careful about spending time working on things that no one is asking for. There goes a duck back there. If no one's asking for it, that means no one's going to reward you for it when it's done. Now, there are safety things that you should look at. For example, users don't usually ask you to do backups. Users don't ask you to do corruption checking. But if it's something that's not going to improve performance or uptime, or if you find yourself trying to stretch to justify how it will improve performance or uptime, you're barking up the wrong tree. Let that one go. Focus on the things that your end users want. That's what gets you raises. That's what gets you promotions. All right, well, I will stop here for two reasons. One, I'm getting cold, and the other is that I see inside the house uh, Andy and Kenji just seem to have woken up, and now i got to go look in and see what's going on with them because we have a water leak coming from below the fridge, and I didn't want to wake them up, but there's water all over the kitchen. So wish me luck, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Oh, and wish me luck at curling, too. Adios.